Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm your guest host, Emmy Vadness, filling in for Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is investigating your life purpose. My guest is Joanne DiMaggio, who has a master's degree in transpersonal studies and is a spiritual mentor. She is the founder and director of the Unity Holistic Healing Center in Charlottesville, Virginia, where she conducts past life regressions and soul writing sessions. She has been involved with Edgar Cayce's Association for Research and Enlightenment since 1987. She has been professionally pursuing past life research and therapy for over 30 years and has headed her own past life research center. Joanne is author of Your Soul Remembers, Accessing Your Past Lives Through Soul Writing. Karma Can Be a Real Pain, Past Life Clues to Current Life Maladies. Soul Writing, Conversing with Your Higher Self. Edgar Casey and the Unfulfilled Destiny of Thomas Jefferson Reborn. And I Did It to Myself Again, New Life Between Life's case studies show how your soul's contract is guiding your life, which is the topic of our conversation today. Joanne is based in the Charlottesville, Virginia area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Joanne. It's so wonderful to have you with us today. Thanks, Emmy. I'm really, really happy to be here. Some people are naturally able to discover their own life purpose, and others find it very difficult. How has your work been able to help people in this regard? Well, you know, that's almost the number one question I get when people come to me. They say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And they're really lost. Uh, and often those answers are in a um, past life regression. So we take them back to the lifetime that is most impacting them today. So this could be the lifetime in which karmic issues arose or their talent, their skill, their ability first came forward. Uh, and then we can explore that. We can also then go into the um, afterlife between the life that they're live, going to live which is the life they're living right now and the life prior to that one to discover what they decided to do, what they decided to set up as their soul's purpose, why they made that choice prior to coming into this, into the body that they're in now. So we go back and we explore that all the ways that they came to that conclusion, like I want to work on this in this next lifetime and this will be my purpose. Why do you think that we don't just come with very clear instructions <laughs> and it seems that we need to kind of take a bit of time to discover some of these aspects of ourselves? Well, you know, I think we do come with instructions, but I don't think that we're aware of it. I don't think that we have the wherewithal to know how to, uh, how to obtain that information, but it's there. Everybody has it. It's all stored in your soul. You just need to make a commitment and, and a desire to, to know that information. But there's all kinds of clues that take place uh, from the time that you're very young. There are things that you resonate to. Uh, that make absolutely no sense for the life that you're living now. Uh, the memory triggers that are, uh, within you that get, that get activated at various points in your life to show you the different areas of life that you really truly feel passionate about. So it is there. Um, actually, when you go through this session, uh, and you look back, you go, oh, I always knew that, didn't I? So I do believe it's there. It's just that it's going to take a little detective work on your part to find it. And in your research, you looked at lives before this life or lives between lives, and you also looked at past life research. What did you discover in that research? 
I've done many regress, uh, research projects dealing with various aspects of reincarnation. The one I did for uh, my book, I did it to myself again, was specifically geared toward the afterlife experience. So what I wanted them to do was to go back to the past life that they're working on now so they can see what were the issues that they decided to bring in with them, go through the death process, go into the afterlife. So this is when your soul is still, if you want to believe that it's in heaven or it's in spirit world or wherever you think you reside prior to coming into that baby's body, uh, that's the, that's the time period we, we then look at. We look to see, um, all different aspects of that. And that does include, um, examining the previous lifetime to see what your talents and skills were, what your issues were. Uh, we look to see, you know, what's your, what's your soul's purpose going to be? What memory triggers were you given? Why did you choose? to be a woman or a man in the next life. Uh, there's just a myriad of questions that we go through to explore what is it that we do when we're between lifetimes, when we're not on the earth. Uh, what happens to our soul? What are some of the activities? Who do we meet? Who do we uh, work with on the other side, so to speak? So it's a, it's a very, very fascinating study. And what did you discover as far as what do people do between lifetimes? Well, you know, when they first get over to the other side, uh, they sort of get acclimated. Uh, they can do a debriefing session with their primary guide, their angel, a member of their soul family, whoever may greet them, uh, and look at that previous lifetime. Look at all of... Uh, they can ask questions at that point in time. Why did this happen to me? Why was I so lonely? Why did I have this relationship issue? That's the time to look at it in much more detail and get an uh, answer from a divine source to explain everything so that it comes out in, in a much more uh, logical way, a way that they can acclimate it to their lives. Then, you know, you, you're assigned a place to stay which is very much whatever you want it to be. Everybody in my research study said that. They said, whatever I thought I could manifest. So if you want to stay in a house that looked like the house that you had when you were alive in the last lifetime, you can have that house again. Uh, if you want to be in a Roman temple, you could be there. If you want to be in a chalet somewhere in the mountains, you could be there. That's where you, that's like your anchor. That's like your base. And from there, you know, you learn things. You go meet up with the Council of Elders. These are the wise uh, guides who, will, they're like guidance counselors at school. So you're going to meet up with them and you're going to go through the previous life, to, not only that life, but other lives, and figure out what is it that you still need to work on while you're in a human body, to be a spiritual being in a human body, having a human experience. So you'll work out almost like a curriculum. You know, it's almost like they have all your report cards spread out and they decide, okay, you're going to work on this, 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 and this. Uh, you'll pick your parents. Members of your soul family will be there and they'll decide whether they want to come in with you in the next life and what role do they want to play. You'll pick out your body. There's just a lot of things that happen uh, in going into the decision on the type of life experience you're going to have the next time you incarnate. And what are some of the life purposes that you discovered in your research with your the people you were working with? And were there any consistencies or was it a variety? Well, it was it was pretty much a variety. Um, I w uh, was helping them work on uh, their ideal, which is bringing in the Edgar Casey uh, teachings into into my practice. Edgar Casey, for those of your uh, listeners who don't know, was the most renowned psychic of the 20th century, uh, and he did like 14,000 readings in his lifetime. Uh, 2000 of which were life readings. So I pull on a lot of the, the uh, wisdom that he was able to, to download basically. Uh, and so one of the things was uh, how to have an ideal. So when you have an ideal in your life, it's the highest, uh, point of, um, what everything you do is measured against. So my ideal is to empower 
and, uh, and inspire through the written word. So it's, um, so I, I we, we talked a little bit about, well, what is your ideal? Uh, what is it that you really want to do? And oftentimes they find that that, that stays the same lifetime after lifetime. I've been a writer for many lifetimes, a researcher many lifetimes. So I'm just sort of continuing what I've done in, in previous lives. Typically people will say, uh, to teach, you know, if I say what, express what your soul's mission is. My soul's mission is to teach, to be a peacemaker to compose music, to be a builder, to express my culinary talents, uh, to, you know, to any number of things. I can't even think of them all to, um, you know, to be good with numbers or something like that. And that's what they came in to do. And oftentimes when they find that out, they're either already doing it or they're very close to having done it, or they thought about doing it, but didn't actually get going. So it identifies their passion. And that really is very helpful for people. You mentioned the term memory trigger. Can you describe what that is? A memory trigger is something that you resonate to, but you don't know why. So it's one of those things. It's like deja vu. For me, my memory triggers all have to do with 18th century American history. So when I was a child, for instance, this is when I had said earlier that sometimes, you know, all this information is available when you are a child because those memory triggers are there from day one. But when I was a child, I loved to listen to Baroque music. I would write with a, a feather pen or quill pen part on parchment paper. I would have a uh, candlelight going. I'd go to the library. I'd get books about Dolly Madison and Abigail Adams. And I love the architecture. Any movie that had anything to do with that time period, I would just soak it up like a sponge. That was a memory trigger for me. Other people have memory triggers like a certain scent. They'll smell something and then it'll evoke a memory for them. Or they'll hear some music, it'll evoke a memory. Or... If say that you go to the same place every year on vacation, you don't know why. You just, you just need to go there. That's how I felt about Virginia. I was born and raised in Chicago, but that never felt like home to me. And when I came to Virginia, my soul gave this collective sigh of relief, like, ah, you're home. That's a memory trigger. So there's, there's a lot of those. If, if you're aware, uh, and watch for synchronicities, the uh, session I do on, the pre-life planning session, uh, I do have them write that down. I'll say to them, list all of your memory triggers just in bulleted copy, and off they go. And they they just, sometimes it's color, sometimes it's numbers. It's amazing. It could be anything. It sounds like a memory trigger can be something that you might have an affinity for or something that's familiar, or maybe even when you meet somebody in your life who you weren't, uh, maybe somebody who is not a family member. And when you meet them, there's sort of an instant recognition. Oh, yeah. I mean, haven't you ever, ever felt like when you met somebody like, I know you, don't I? You seem awfully familiar to me, but you can't place it. Uh, that happens quite a bit. That's a member of your soul family for sure. And, um, that memory is there. I have met people like that throughout my life. And it turns out we were together when we did some work, uh, regression work together. We did find out that we, that we did know each other from that time period. This concept of a soul family, a soul tribe or a soul group and your, all your travels and research, Joanne, what have you found as far as how many soul members might we have? And it, you mentioned earlier that it sounds like they don't always reincarnate with you in every lifetime. No, it's their choice. We, um, we have traveled together with the same group of souls from the beginning of time. The whole expression, old soul, there's no such thing as an old soul. We were all created at the exact same time. The difference between us and why somebody seems like an old soul compared to somebody else is the number of times they've been on the earth. So they've chosen to incarnate more often than another soul. So that gives them 
a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge, a lot more wisdom about the makings of this planet and what it's like to be in, a, in the physical plane. So they come across as having all this additional higher level wisdom, but in fact, they're the same age as, as everybody else. There's no number associated with how big a soul group is. I have found that they operate at various tiers. So you have a very tight knit group in the middle, and then they they work themselves out. So you have members of your family, you have then members of your extended family, and then you have your friends and you have your uh, colleagues at work, uh, spouses, children, lovers, business uh, our mentors, teachers, anybody that you run into and you have a uh, a relationship with as part of that group. Now, some of them are much closer to you than others. They've signed up to play uh, a more active role in your life, whereas others are just sort of on the peripheral. So they, they're, they're almost like a support group, you know, and all of them come in with a specific purpose. So they know why you're here. They know what you want to accomplish. And so say that you want to deal with the issue of abandonment. So they'll say to you, okay, I'm going to help you with that. So at some point in our interactions, I'm going to abandon you so that you could feel what that's like. If in fact, that's what you wanted to experience. Maybe you abandoned somebody in a previous life. And so the karma to balance it out is that you're going to experience that in this life. But there's hundreds and hundreds of other examples, but the roles are tailor-made to what you're dealing with. Now, although we're with each other lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, the, the benefit of that is that they know you on a very intimate level. They know exactly what you're working on. Um, but they also do not always appear the same. In other words, they change gender and they change role. So your mother in this life could have been your husband in a previous life. And and we change, we go from male to female, we go from different aspects of, of relationships uh, so that we have a really well-rounded experience together. When reading your book, I read that you mentioned that part of why you wanted to explore this more is that you were hearing people say that they were blaming others for their problems, for their challenges. Could you share how your work has helped people with that? Sure. Well, I've been doing past life work now for over 30 years. I began in uh, 1987 when I first uh, became part of Edgar Casey's ARE. And I, in the 90s, I actually started to, to uh, do sessions with people. Um, over all those years, one of the common things that I hear is a client will come to me He'll, he'll, he or she will tell me what's going on in their life, but they will always blame it on somebody. It's my mother's fault. It's my father's fault. It's my daughter or my son's fault. It's my husband's fault. They never say it's, I want to find out why, what I had to do with this. You know, what part of this decision making was mine? And so I realized, I thought, you know, if they understood that, I think their life would be a lot easier, and especially in, in terms of the relationship with others. If they understood that this was the decision that they made, they set up the socioeconomic uh, conditions in which they came in. So they knew coming in who their parents were going to be, uh, what their finances were going to be, what religious sect they were going to be brought up in, what nationality, what race they were going to be. All of that was factored into that decision making. So uh, now we have free will. So even it's not like they made a blueprint and you have to stick to that blueprint because you can't change your mind at any given time. But the general outline of that life, the opportunities that would come up in order for them to work on whatever karmic issues they decided that they needed to work on was all was all planned out was all made as a possibility within the framework of the family and the condition and the environment in which they were born into and how did you originally become interested in doing this kind of research well you know i didn't really 
do much in the area of of uh, the afterlife studies. I was focused primarily on the the reincarnation part of it. I didn't. It never really came up at any of my regressions. Nobody started talking about, well, I'm in spirit now, and this is what I'm doing. But then I started to read some of the Michael Newton material. And as I'm reading it, um, I was comparing it to the Casey material. And I realized that a lot of it didn't quite mesh up. So I was curious about that. I also wanted to do something to help people get over their fear of death. Because my feeling was, if you get a bunch of strangers in for a research project, and you ask them, what does it feel like to die? And they all give you basically the same answer. Then wouldn't it stand to reason that you would think, well, gee, if those 25 or 50 people all we're saying that this is what death is like. Isn't that the way it's going to be for me? And gee, that doesn't sound too bad. Uh, there's maybe nothing to really be fearful of. And that then changes their whole attitude and their whole outlook. So in a way, that's, that's that aspect of the healing work that I do that, that comes into play. So those were the main reasons. And what did you discover as far as what do people experience when they do pass from this earth realm to the other? They all said it was a very peaceful experience. They all said they felt like they were just floating. You know, although some of them said that when they the soul left the body, uh, they felt a little bit of a tug or uh or a, a jerking out of the body but most of them by far said oh this is so peaceful i feel so released i feel pe- uh happy um this is great i i'm you know i can't wait to get out of here meaning meaning the body was still there this is at the point that the soul was leaving the body that's when i asked the question so most of them said it was a, a really quite peaceful and uh, serene experience. How did you begin getting involved with Edgar Cayce and the Association for Research and Enlightenment? Back in 1987, uh, Shirley McLean, uh, her, her book Out on a Limb, which I'm sure many of your listeners read, that was her groundbreaking book, the first of many. They turned that into a miniseries on ABC and it was on for two nights in January and I hadn't read the book, but I did watch the mini series. Now I had been interested in reincarnation as a teenager. I had grown up Catholic, but I had a lot of questions and I started reading books on reincarnation books on Edgar Cayce. I read books that were written by uh, Jess Stern and Ruth Montgomery. A lot of them, top metaphysical writers of that time. And so the um, the information in Shirley MacLaine's miniseries touched on reincarnation. And that, for me, relit my passion for that topic that had sort of gone dormant um, after, I mean, I was it was active when I was a teenager. And then I went into college, I got married, had a family, forgot all about it. And then, um, then Shirley comes out without on a limb. And oh, I could, at that point, it was like a, a wake up call. I think for, not only for me, but for a lot of sleeping metaphysicians, I'm sure there are thousands of us that, you know, we weren't really following careers in, in this area, but that book re, you know, reignited our desire to look more into it. So, um, I thought, well, I've got to find some like-minded people, right? And so I knew about Edgar Casey. I knew that he had, uh, founded the Association for Research and Enlightenment, which we call ARE, uh, in Virginia Beach. And so, um, I looked into it and became a member. And at that time, they were diversifying in that they were starting uh, core teams across the country. And I was living in Chicago at that time, and they were starting uh, a team in, in the Heartland region. So it took in like five states in the Midwest. I contacted the head of that core team. 
I offered my volunteer services because I had a background in marketing and public relations. And uh, I was already writing at that point. And so I came in and joined their core team. And I have been with them ever since. With the ARE, I should say, not with the core team in Chicago. Well, it sounds like you've really listened to your memory triggers, Joanne, as you've gone forward. (laughs) Absolutely. That's how I got to uh, Virginia, because I had a past life here in Virginia. And um, when I was in college, when I would write essays on this time period, I had a professor tell me I had the most uncanny feel for the 18th century of any student he ever had. And I thought, yeah, you know, I do. And so after college, I decided I was going to visit all the places on the eastern seaboard for which I had this uncanny feel for. And when I got to Virginia, I felt like, wow, this is home. I didn't know why at that point. But later on, as I as I delved into my own past life journey, I discovered that I actually did have... uh two lifetimes here in Virginia. Why do you think it seems that many people are not as in touch with their previous lifetimes or that we seem to have some type of possibly programmed forgetting when we come into this current incarnation? Well, first of all, I think if you remembered all of your past lives, it would drive you absolutely crazy and you would get nothing done in this life. This life is about this life. It's not about the past lives. The past lives are there to help you understand better what this life is all about. It explains things to you. You know, it's, it's, um, the, the way the universe operates, the way karma operates. It's a totally just system. It's, it's, you reap what you sow. It's cause and effect. So when you look at things that are going on in your life now, you could find the origins in a previous lifetime. Often finding those origins releases some of the, the, um, I don't know what you call it, the energetic hold that it might have over you. This is especially true with, um, people dealing with some chronic physical conditions. Uh, they go back to a lifetime in which the condition first manifested. And many times when they find out what that was, they're able to release it. And, and that releases it in this life too. So there's benefits of going from one life to the other of understanding. It's not meant for entertainment purposes at all. It is a healing tool. It's a sacred tool. Uh, and I think that the, that I have seen so many people have expressed their aha moments. And it's so powerful that oftentimes you only need one session. Uh, I don't have many clients who come over and over and over again, unless they really want to find out detail after detail after detail about a particular past life. But usually it's one session, they get what they need out of it, and then that's it. So it's it's extremely powerful and transformative. And it's also very humbling for me to lead them uh, into discovering this aspect of their soul's journey. Some people talk about the term karma, and there's different interpretations and understandings and maybe beliefs around karma. What have you discovered around uh, your understanding of what karma is and how it can play out and manifest in our lives? As I said, karma is cause and effect. So it's, I remember growing up when I was uh, going to Catholic school, I remember one time I was thinking, um, well, if I cross the street on my way home and I get hit by a car and I die and this, and I had meat today. It was a, say it's a Friday. Okay. I went home for lunch. I had a ham sandwich. I was coming back to school. I crossed the street and I got hit by a car. I went straight to hell because it was a sin to eat meat on Friday. So I thought, what kind of a loving God would do that? to his creation. And it never made any sense to me. Sin did not make any sense to me. You know, how you can do whatever it is you wanted to do, go into a confessional, tell the priest what you did, get absolution, you know, say your penance, and your soul was squeaky clean. Karma isn't like that. Karma is much harder because 
sooner or later, you're going to have to account for what you said, what you thought, what you did. So it's a, uh, in the end, it, it may not happen in the next lifetime. It may happen a thousand years from now, but sometimes some way you're going to balance those scales. So, for instance, Edgar Casey had uh, a woman come to him. She was dealing with issues of obesity. She wanted to know what was the source of the obesity. And he said to her, um, in a previous life, you made fun of people that were obese. So now she's finding out what it's like to to be overweight, to have to deal with that. And there is just example after example after example of, of how that works. Um Someone who was blind in this life, Casey said they had been, uh, uh, they had gouged out somebody's life, uh, somebody's eye with a hot poker in a previous life. So it's, it's, it's not always that, <laughs> that gory, but, um, but it's often, you know, you reap what you sow. So, if you had a lifetime of greed in the previous life, you can very well expect that at some point you're going to have to deal with that in this life and, and you'll deal with the opposite. You're going to, you know, maybe be dealing with issues of poverty. So, um, it makes just perfect sense. It just shows how the universe is, is, uh, uh, you know, balanced in every way and harmonious that way. Uh, and so, so, you know, I think every, and everything that we do, everything that we say is, is kept in what I, we call the Akashic records, which is like the universe's supercomputer, which means that every thought, word, and deed is recorded there. So it's not like you can get away with anything. Uh, and people can access that information, uh, just as much as Mr. Casey was able to do that. So all the information is there. We just need to know, uh, we have to have a desire to want to, to receive it and then, and then actually go, go about doing that. And do you think that it's possibly to learn more about compassion and love versus punishment? Well, I don't believe punishment so much is the, is the right word. I, you know, compassion, love is actually, yeah, that's why we're here, right? So that everything ends up, uh, dealing with, uh, love for ourselves, love for our, our fellow, uh, human beings. So, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of lessons that are all rolled up into any given lifetime. You know, maybe you feel that, you know, you don't, you have, you don't have any acceptance or approval in your life right now. Well, it could be that you didn't have it before and you're, or you didn't give it before and now you're experiencing. So it's the, it's that beautiful back and forth, uh, that I think is just so remarkable and it makes perfect sense in the context of that person's individual life and their journey. It may not make any sense for you. Because you're like, I don't understand why that's such an issue. Well, it is an issue for them, and there are reasons why it is. So that's why it's really good not to judge other people. There's explanations for everything within karmic law as to why they're dealing with what they're dealing with, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So, um, and the same thing with, with souls coming in that have, that have some sort of a physical challenge. You know, it's not that they did something necessarily bad in a previous life and they're being punished for it. It could be because they're coming in to serve as a lesson for those around them. So in other words, how do the people around them react to what they're dealing with? Uh, so there's just lots of levels to it. And uh, it's also perfectly thought out and just makes absolute sense when you think about it in the larger context of life. Let's go back to the Council of Elders. In your research, you discovered, was it all of your participants in the research study that described connecting with the Council of Elders? Is that correct? Yeah, they all described uh, connecting with the Council. I asked them, you know, to go describe the council chamber to me. Many of them described it as uh, what you would 
describe a courtroom looking like or the Senate chamber looking like. So that almost gave it a sense of it being judgmental, but it wasn't. It wasn't at all. There's no judgment going on here at all. Nobody's going, you didn't do this or you should have done that. None of that goes on uh, at all. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I like to use the analogy of guidance counselors at school. So, you know, you finished your year, you took your summer break, or you would have done this probably before. You go to your guidance counselors, you sit with them and you go, oh, okay, let's figure out what I need to do in the next time, in, in my next level, my next grade level. And then they decide a curriculum for you. It could be three subjects, could be four subjects. You know, they'll say, you know, you didn't pass this class or this class on responsibility, you sort of blew that off. Or, you know, this class on finances, you need to repeat that. But you did pass this one or this one or that one. And so they designed this curriculum for you. Now, in terms of who are the Council of Elders, I describe them as a group of wise beings, uh, ascended masters. Many of them have not been incarnate before, so they haven't been in a physical form. Although I have had some of my research subjects have said that um, that they have been a f it was interesting, Dr. Michael Newton, in all of his studies, said that nobody ever saw uh, a religious uh, symbol or person on their council. I had almost all of them saw either Jesus, Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene, Moses, one of the archangels. It was really funny um, that that happened quite a bit in my study. Some of them saw um, nature uh, entities, as, uh, you know, on, on their council. Others were absolutely um, sort of funny, ridiculously funny. It was like, oh, I have Tinkerbell or I have Jack in the Box. So I don't, I don't question anything anybody says to me because to them, that's what they're seeing. There could have been a reason for that, for using that, that sort of physical, um, uh, uh appearance. Uh, but we didn't go into that. But for most people, um, they would describe them as very wise. Uh, a lot of them said they were old, old men with white beards wearing, um, white robes. Uh, so there was a variety of them. Uh, and their whole purpose was just to help them design the next lifetime and then give them a pep talk or some words of encouragement before they left. Do you think that some of these experiences might be culturally dependent? Could be. So, for instance, maybe the people that were seeing Jesus and Moses and, you know, Mary and Mary Magdalene, maybe that was all uh, from their Christian uh, upbringing. I, I, I don't really know because we never got into that. We never, I never questioned them about that. So, um, so I did not know at that point where they were coming from as far as their cultural background was concerned. Yeah, and you've trained as a hypnotherapist. Correct. In your study, providing these hypnotherapy regression sessions, sometimes there is a question around that maybe the hypnotherapist is unknowingly giving suggestions to the clients. And I'm just curious how you were able to be careful with that in your research. From the very beginning, I wanted to make sure that everything that I did was very professional and that I only did it after years and years of study. Uh, I let people know I don't do this for recreational purposes. It's not entertainment to me. It's, it's, it's spiritual work. I got my spiritual mentor training through Atlantic University, my master's degree in transpersonal studies through Atlantic University. So I really was um, very cautious going into this. And I think a lot of people feel comfortable working with me because of that. And I, I've told them, I'm not a medium. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a reader. I do not ever, ever tell anybody 
who they were in a prior lifetime. I don't tell them, I don't give them any information whatsoever. My job is to guide them because all that information is within them. It's within their soul. And that's the best place to get it. You know, it, it's not having a, a third party relay it to you because then it gets filtered through their consciousness. And so how accurate is it by the time it gets to you? I don't know. But I, I want people to experience it totally on their own. Uh, I may help them along, like say, okay, well, what happens after that? Or what happens next? Or I'll, I'll ask a lot of questions because I, I tell them I'm a reporter for the universe. And so I'm going to just interview them. Uh, and I'm going to interview the late great you and find out who you were, what you looked like, um, where you lived, what was the time period, uh, who were the people in your life? What was the significant event in your life? What was your death like? Uh, and then the important questions, um, what were your last thoughts as your soul left your body? Uh, what are the parallels? What are the behavior patterns between this life and that one? And then are there any people in this life who were in your life then? And if so, what, what role are they playing? So, so we take our time and do all of that. Uh, but they do that all on their own. I don't coax them at all. I think that hypnotherapy, where it really connects a person like you're describing into their own inner knowing, their own intuition, uh, can be, you know, depending on the application, but for cer certainly with what you're doing, can be the best way to help people access that information. It also seems that then, uh, depending on the person's consciousness, their own awareness, the, um, sort of keys or doors that have been open that they're ready to allow in that information they're ready to allow in that they will receive that as they're comfortable versus somebody telling them information and it just doesn't quite make sense and then they can maybe sometimes even be confused for years with somebody um, some information that someone may have told them Yes, exactly, exactly. They're, they, uh, when the, when the information comes from within, they know it's true. If there's any emotion associated with the regression, I tell them that that's a sign that it's a real memory and not something they're making up because most of them will say to me when, before we even begin, I'm afraid I'm going to make this up. I'm afraid this is all going to be my imagination. But when it's over, I'll say to them, would you have made that story up and, and told me that story? And, they said, no way would I have ever made that, that story up. So, um, if they feel emotion, I can't make them, I can't make them cry or laugh or do anything. That's something that, you know, that they're in total control. And I tell them that too. You're in total control. You can open your eyes and walk out of the room, uh, at any point. It's, it, I can't, it's not like stage hypnosis where I'm going to make you bark like a dog or quack like a duck. That's, that's not at all what I do. I do guided imagery. So it's just helping you get into a very deep, relaxed state of mind just through some deep breathing. I always say a prayer of protection, throw some white light around them to keep them safe. And, um, you know, I just think that that. And now this is not to say that there are some people who don't get anything, because I have had people who, for whatever reason, are blocked and it's black. They'll say, I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. I don't feel anything. I will work with them. I have different scripts that I can jump to, to to give them a different scenario. I've got like three of those that I use. If they still can't get anything, then we just sort of call it a day. But um, most people, I'd say 95% at least uh, get something out of out of a session. Other than the person's own inner knowing, which is incredibly powerful, and we don't want to discount that at all, because one might argue it's actually the most important information we can really receive. Have you or any of your clients ever been able to verify information they've received? Ah, uh, yes, they have. They have. I've had a few. Um, for instance, they may say that they died in a plague in a certain year, and they'll go back and they'll research that or they'll say um oh that they were living in a uh, a place in texas and uh that they own land and they'll go back and they'll trace that some of them describe being in a monastery up in the hills and then they'll go looking for monasteries and they'll find the exact one 
many people are able to, but most people don't don't bother to do that. Um, some people will have birthmarks on different parts of their body, which often uh, Dr. Ian Stevenson, who is here at the University of Virginia, uh, did a lot of study in this area about birthmarks being remnants of a past life wound. So uh, this is especially something that comes up with people who are working on physical karma. Uh, you know, they can see that they had this this um, this uh, birthmark and find out that's the exact place that they were wounded. I had uh, one gentleman here in Charlottesville who um, claimed to be the reincarnation of Stonewall Jackson. And, um, now the whole, the whole thing about famous past lives, we could talk about that for hours, but I do have some people who come in and say they were so-and-so and, and, you know, I don't judge, but, um, some of them come in on the flimsiest of, (laughs) you know, like I had one woman who said she was Patrick Henry and I said, why do you think you're Patrick Henry? And she said, because he's a good talker and so am I. (laughs) So it's not always like that. But this fellow that that said he was Stonewall Jackson, um, I do believe he was the real deal. First of all, he looks exactly like him. Uh, Second of all, uh, he actually was working at uh, uh, Jackson's home. Uh, and he was remembering what was in different rooms. He had me take him on one of our sessions together. He says, would you let me walk through the house so that I could remember what was in these different rooms so that I could then relay, relay that to the, the people there. I don't know if he ever told him he was telling him that because he had been Jackson or, or what, but you know, cause many people who are famous, they're very, very cautious about, you know, whether they're going to share that with somebody. Cause you know, they know darn well, they're going to get looked at like they've got two heads. So not everybody is, uh, most people are just John Smith's and Jane Doe's. In your book, I did it to myself again. I think it's worthwhile to point out that while you had 25 people for that particular book, you mentioned that you actually have researched more people and that it was really the publisher who advised you to not have more people. Right. When I did my book, uh, Karma Can Be a Real Pain, which was the book prior to this, uh, the one you mentioned, I had 50 people that I had and I had spent over a year doing this research with these people. And the publisher said, I can't publish 50 case studies because the book would be so huge that nobody could afford to buy it. So he said, 25 max, Joanne. So I was like, oh, I don't want to just do 25. I actually did more than 25 for, for this book, but I only put in there 25 uh, of the case studies. So just to circle back, in that particular book, you you did past life regressions with these people, and you also looked at their lives between their lives as well. That's right. And why did you design it that way? Well, I I felt that they needed to know, uh, they needed to do the past life part first, because they really needed to know, um, you know, what were the issues that were triggering what was going on in in, uh, this life, because... When they were in the afterlife, they chose that particular past life to finish in this life. So in other words, you end up with um, what I call unfinished business. Okay, so these are issues that you were supposed to finish up in your previous life, and you didn't for whatever reason. So those got put on the back burner for a time when your soul felt it was perfect to work on them. So now what I found, which is really interesting, 25% of the people in my study went back a thousand years to a past life. So it's not like it's the life immediately prior to this one that you're working on. It's very seldom consecutive. You know, it jumps all over the place. So I wanted to go to the life to see what, what, what happened back then? What, what are you working on now? What, what are the, you know, what are the things you're bringing in with you to, to finish? And so then we go to the afterlife part to see how they're going to take all those pieces 
uh, from the previous life and how they're going to work on them in the upcoming life. And then they design that life. You know, they pick their mom and dad out. That's our choice, by the way, which I love to tell my children. You picked me. I didn't pick you. <laughs> and, uh, and then members of our soul family decide, you know, who wants to come in with us. So, uh, you know, so it's really quite ingenious the way the whole thing works. And what was most striking to you? A couple of things. One of them was I, I've always had this f- talk about fear of death. I've always had this fear of, of torture, of, uh, especially of people that are, that have horrible endings to their life. They're burned to death or something like that. And I did have, uh, a gentleman. He's a, a, a man in his seventies. He's a lawyer in this life. Uh, he was an African American. Well, back then they weren't called that, but he was an African female uh, on a plantation in Savannah, uh, Georgia. Uh, Very beautiful. Uh, The master's son, you know, was attracted to her. She wasn't returning his affection, so he decided that he was going to make a spectacle of her, a, a lesson. And he had a party. He called in all of these or surrounding people to come and watch while he whipped her to death. Now, I, I asked, it was interesting, talk about karma. In this life, that soul that was in that body came back to be an attorney in this life working on, what do you think, civil rights issues. So that's where the, the karma comes in. But he said to me, he said, I didn't feel any pain. He says, because I, my soul left that body long before that body died, before death came. And you know what? I've heard that from other people that uh, I had one in my, uh, was she's female in this life and that life was male and was tortured on some sort of a, of a, a pirate ship or something like that. I've heard others that were like talking about Joan of Arc. And that her her soul left that body before that body was consumed by flame. And so it's like they said, you don't feel that pain, which is why death is easier than birth, they say. So I was really a little surprised at that aspect of it. But the rest of it was pretty much what I expected it would be. You mentioned that you have people pay attention to the last thoughts that go through their mind when they die. Why is that significant? Because that often sets up the next lifetime. I had one woman who had head to toe psoriasis in this life. And she came to me because she wanted to know what's the source of the psoriasis. Why do I have to deal with this? She went back to a past life in the Old West in which she was a call girl. So she was a prostitute out West somewhere. And when she died, I said, what are your last thoughts as your soul is leaving your body? And she said, I don't want to be touched anymore. So in this life, she manifests a skin condition in which nobody wants to touch her. Mm-hmm. So the, I, there's story after story after story like that. So I tell people, watch what you're thinking at that last moment, <laughs> you know, figure out what you want in the next life and put that out there <laughs> and maybe it'll come true for you. Yeah, critical thoughts at a critical time. Uh, it gives us all a lot to think about for sure. Yeah. What is your sense as far as how many lifetimes do we live and what happens after we've lived them all or do we keep reincarnating? Well, let's go back to my analogy about the school counselors. If you think of Earth as a school and we're coming to Earth to learn different aspects of being a uh, spiritual being in a physical body, it's the equivalent of you know, getting your PhD. So you start out in kindergarten and you work your way up. Uh, you keep, uh, working on the different lessons that you want to experience until you have exhausted those. Uh, then you don't have to come back anymore. But there are people who come back even if they don't have to come back because they want to come back to be in service to humanity. So they decided I'm just going to come in and I'm going to help out. So sometimes it's not because they have any issues that they're dealing with. They're just coming here to, to, to lend a helping hand. 
we have lifetimes anywhere from 50 to 200 years space between. Uh, it depends. Now, people that commit suicide, people that are killed prematurely, like in a war, or uh, or crime on the street if they're murdered for some reason. If your life ends prematurely, it's like dropping out of school. Okay, you didn't finish that class. You got to go back. So those people tend to come back immediately, like you know, right away. So. Um, so it just depends on, on how ambitious you are and whether you're an old soul or not. You know, I say old souls are slow learners. We just keep coming back <laughs> to learn more and more about what it's like to be on the earth. This is just a beautiful planet. There's, and some people come for no reason at all. I had a client the other day. She couldn't find anything in that life that, that was upsetting. No trauma, no illness. Um, she just was just happy as a clam. And yet I said to her, well, that could be because it's a respite from the life you had prior to that one. Because oftentimes, if you have a very, very tumultuous life where you a lot of challenges, a lot of trauma happening, you could come back like you're on vacation, which is how we started here in the first place. We just thought of the earth as this is a cool place to be. Let's go and have some fun. And uh, so now it's it serves as our as one of our schools. So, yeah, but it's usually we get some time in between, depending on, you know, you've got to you've got to make plans and you've got to set this whole thing. Your and your entrance has to be exactly on time, you know, uh, to get into the parents that you want at the time that you want. Um, I've got another granddaughter coming in on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm so excited uh, for her. Uh, I can't wait because uh, when when my grandchildren come in, I just first thing I do the moment I see them is I whisper to them, I'm here for you. I'm here to help you and guide you. And I'll be here as long as I can. Uh, and just welcome them to the earth, you know, welcome them to this beautiful planet of ours. And these kids coming in now have a big job ahead of them. Uh, and so, uh, and, but they're coming in with, um, yeah, uh, with all the tools that they need. So I'm very hopeful about the future based on, on what I'm seeing of this coming in generation. Well, that's great to hear because we definitely need that. We need them. Yeah. Your research reminds me of Helen Wombach's. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah. 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 I admire Helen and, um, I've been told by other past life therapists that, that, that my research is similar to hers. So, um, so I'm glad to pick up the baton and continue with it. Well, thank you for all of your contributions and giving us so much all to, to think about and ponder and to explore. Is there anything else you would like to share? I also, uh, teach something that I call soul writing. Soul writing is a written form of meditation. So the way I like to explain it is if you think of prayer as you talking to God, God as you t is a meditation as God talking to you, soul writing is you taking notes. Uh, this was my thesis for my master's degree. Uh, it's something Edgar Casey taught. He called it inspirational writing back in the 30s and 40s. I just changed the name to soul writing because it seemed like that's what it was. And it can be applied to all areas of your life. It's really a lot more mainstream uh, than the regression work is, but it is something anybody can do. And thank you, Emmy, for this wonderful experience. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for your fascinating contributions and your wealth of knowledge and experience and sharing with all of us here today. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.